Hi, welcome to a lecture on Effective Aperture. Effective Aperture is one avenue to answering the following question. What is the power which is delivered to some impedance representing a receiver in the scenario shown on the left on the screen? In this scenario, we have an instant electric field expressed in terms of its electric field intensity. And we have an antenna, and this could be any antenna, as long as we can come up with an equivalent circuit for this antenna, which requires the impedance and the vector effective length. And this antenna is attached to a load represented here as Z sub R, which represents a receiver. So the question is, given this instant electric field, how much power gets delivered to the receiver? The direct attack on this problem is to find the voltage and current at the antenna terminals using an equivalent circuit model for the receiving antenna. And then given that voltage and current, you can compute the power in the usual way. For example, assuming these are peak, not RMS, uh, phasor quantities, the received power would simply be one half of the real part of V times I conjugate. So let's go ahead and try to do that. Here, I've substituted the equivalent circuit for the antenna, including its open circuit voltage, which is given by the dot product of the instant electric field and the vector effective length. The series antenna impedance, which we know to be the impedance of the antenna on transmit, and so now we have a simple circuit, which we can evaluate using basic circuit theory. Now, one thing we should consider is what the appropriate value for the receive impedance should be. In other words, the input impedance to this receiver. And we know from basic circuit theory that to maximize that power, we should select the receiver input impedance to be equal to the conjugate of the series impedance in the Thevenin equivalent source model. In other words, Z sub R should equal Z sub A conjugate. That will maximize the power delivered to the receiver. So I should highlight a common pitfall, and that's to assume instead that we should use ZR equals Z sub A and not ZR equals Z sub A conjugate. Choosing ZR equals Z sub A merely eliminates reflection and does not maximize power in general. Now, if the series impedance, that is the antenna impedance, is completely real valued, then these two things are the same. But it's pretty rare for antenna impedance to be completely real valued, so you need to remember that receiver impedance that's going to maximize power delivered to the receiver is going to be this one, Z sub R equals Z sub A conjugate. Furthermore, note that the power delivered to the receiver is maximized when the instant electric field is copolarized with the antenna. The instant electric field could be polarized in any direction, including directions in which the total power delivered to the receiver ends up being zero. If we want to maximize power delivered to the receiver, then we're interested in the case where it's copolarized. That'll give us an upper bound. So recognizing that, we're going to define a quantity, S super I sub CO, or co for copolarized, and that's the magnitude of the instant electric field intensity squared divided by 2 times the wave impedance in whatever medium this is occurring in, usually free space. And we're evaluating this in the special case in which the instant electric field is copolarized to give us the maximum value. Also, recall that the quantity, power density, is watts per meter squared. It is in the spatial sense that we're referring to power density. From dimensional analysis, that is looking at the units, we see that there must be a real valued constant such that the maximum power delivered to the receiver, the thing we're looking for, is related somehow to that maximum power density instant on the antenna. We see that there must be a value having units of meters squared involved here because Power density, watts per meter squared, times meters squared, would give us watts, and that's what we're looking for. 
So we can recast this problem as one of finding this quantity a sub e, which we are going to call the effective aperture. Now first, note that even though effective aperture has units of meters squared, units of area, it may or it may not be related to the physical size of the antenna. There are numerous examples where it is closely related to the size of the antenna, and I can show you examples where it is not related to the size of the antenna, including one example to follow shortly. Okay, now we want to put the effective aperture in terms of variables that we already know, in particular in terms of the effective length. To do this, we start off with the fact that the open circuit voltage in the equivalent circuit model for the receive antenna is given by the dot product of the instant electric field and the vector effective length. And since we're assuming copole here to get maximum values, to get the upper bounds, this quantity just reduces to the magnitude of the instant electric field times the effective length, a scalar quantity. Now we apply circuit analysis. The voltage at the antenna terminals is equal to the open circuit voltage times a voltage divider, the voltage divider being Z sub R divided by Z sub A plus Z sub R. If you've forgotten, just remember this is the total series impedance and this is the impedance across which we are measuring the voltage. Now we note that Z sub R should be Z sub A conjugate for maximum power, so we make that substitution and we get this expression. Next, we note that the antenna impedance in general can be written in terms of its real and imaginary parts, those being R sub A and X sub A respectively. And so the denominator here becomes simply two times the real part because the imaginary parts will cancel in that denominator. And then we substitute the expression for the open circuit voltage here. And this gives us an expression for the voltage at the antenna terminals. Next, we want the current through the antenna terminals. And that's simply the open circuit voltage divided by the series impedance in the equivalent circuit, which gives us this expression. So now we simply need to compute the power. That's one half the real part of V times I conjugate, as explained above. Here we simply substitute the expressions that we have derived, and this all reduces to this expression, simply that it is equal to the magnitude of the electric field intensity times the magnitude of the effective length squared, and divided by eight times the real part of the antenna impedance. Almost done. Now all we need to do to get the effective aperture is divide that quantity, the maximum power delivered to the receiver, by the associated instant power density, the instant power density that gave rise to that maximum power. So here we're simply substituting those two expressions, a little bit of algebra to eliminate uh, common factors, and we find that the effective aperture is given by this expression, in which we find it is proportional to the impedance of the medium, usually the impedance of free space. It is proportional to the square of the effective length and divided by four times the real part of the antenna impedance. So this is one way of computing or calculating the effective aperture of an antenna in the case of conjugate matching and copolarized instant electric field. Let's do an example to demonstrate this. We'll use the electrically short dipole about the simplest possible physically realizable antenna imaginable. And it's in free space, which means that the free space impedance will be used, that's 377 ohms. The effective length for this dipole is worked out in another lecture or in one of the references. The effective length is simply L over two times sine theta, where theta is simply the angle between the angle of arrival of the wave with respect to the axis of the dipole. Length is the length of the dipole, and because it's an electrically short dipole, we're saying that length is much, much less than the wavelength. The real part of the impedance of the dipole is, in general, the sum of the resistance due to materials in the dipole and the radiation resistance, R sub rad. Just for simplicity here, we'll neglect the loss within materials. 
commonly, not always, but quite often, that loss in materials is small relative to the radiation resistance. So the real part of the intended impedance is to a very good approximation simply equal to its radiation resistance. And for an electrically short dipole, we have this expression for the radiation resistance, 20 pi squared ohms times uh, the electrical length squared. Since we're in free space, the impedance is simply 377 ohms, at least approximately. So now we have everything we need to calculate the effective length. In the numerator, we're simply applying this expression and substituting the values that we have obtained here. We turn the crank and we find the effective length is 0.12 lambda squared, wavelength squared, times sine squared theta. Remarkably simple and somewhat useful result. Note that this result is independent of the size of the antenna, in this case, independent of L. So for an electrically short dipole, it turns out that the effective aperture, this thing which is telling us how much power we can capture out of the air, is independent of the size of the antenna. That's kind of a remarkable idea, but it's true, at least for the electrically short dipole. For antennas which aren't electrically small, I will tell you that you will see some dependence on the size of the antenna, but that's a topic for another lecture. And remember, to get this number, Z sub R must be conjugate matched to Z sub A. In other words, the receiver input impedance must be conjugate matched to the antenna impedance, and we're assuming that the instant electric field is copolarized. To the extent that those things are not true, the effective aperture that you observe will be less. Next, we want to talk about the antenna theorem, which plays a role in this whole business of effective aperture and also in the way that antennas absorb power out of the air. The antenna theorem lets us relate the effective aperture, which is a received concept, the way we've been talking about it, to directivity, which is a transmit concept. Now, some people refer to this relationship as reciprocity, but that's not quite uh, right. At least it's not quite the whole story. Here, we're going to talk about how we can relate effective aperture, the received concept, to directivity, the transmit concept, and the way we're going to make that connection is through this thing called the antenna theorem. The antenna theorem says that the effective aperture averaged over all possible angles of incidence, over all possible values of theta and phi, turns out to be equal to a constant. And that constant turns out to be wavelength squared over 4 pi. And this is true for any antenna. Now to show this requires a bit of thermodynamics. Now if you have no experience in thermodynamics, don't panic. It's actually a relatively simple idea. And I'm going to show you the, the relevant concepts. So in this figure, we see a special experiment. In this experiment, we have two chambers. These chambers are designed such that they are held at a constant temperature, T, and the walls are made up of black body material, which simply means that they don't reflect electromagnetic waves. In the one chamber, we have an antenna. In the chamber on the right, we have a load, and for this case, we're just showing the load as a resistor, but in fact, it could be any load. And then we ask the question, when we do this, what is the power exchanged between the antenna and the load? We know that the antenna must produce some power and deliver that to the load. And similarly, we know that the resistor, or whatever load is in this other chamber, must create power, namely through thermal noise mechanisms, and that will tend to be sent to the antenna. Well, if we're in thermodynamic equilibrium, if the temperatures are the same throughout here, then these two powers should be the same. In other words, we would expect that the power originating at the antenna and sent to the load is equal to the power originating at the load and sent to the antenna. So the power created by the load is well known to be this quantity, K times T times B, where K is a constant known as Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. T 
is the temperature in Kelvin, and B is the bandwidth in Hertz. So if you know those three things, then you can compute the power the load is sending towards the antenna. For the antenna, we know that the walls of the chamber radiate as a black body. In other words, we will see power coming from the walls due to the temperature of the walls, the thermal radiation associated with the walls. The antenna sees this as an incident power density, and there's a principle from physics known as the Rayleigh-Jeans law. And what the Rayleigh-Jeans law says, at least for radio frequencies, is that the power seen by the antenna per unit solid angle, per steridian, is a certain number of watts per square meter, and that quantity is 2 times k times t times b divided by wavelength squared. And this is the total power, and that total power is evenly divided between two orthogonal instant polarizations. So the copolarized component will be at most ktb divided by wavelength squared. In other words, that factor of 2 disappears. And so a conjugate matched load will receive KTB divided by wavelength squared times the effective aperture, which gives us a quantity in watts per steridian. This is how much power is arriving per unit solid angle. So if we break up the chamber into little patches of theta and phi, this is how much power we're getting from each one of those little patches. So if we sum over all those possible little patches, the way we would do that is we would express that quantity, the power per steridian here, and we would integrate over solid angle, that's sine theta d theta d phi, and then integrate from phi 0 to 2 pi, theta 0 to pi. This quantity here is a constant with respect to the integration, so it comes out. And we'll do one little trick. What we will do is we'll multiply by 4 pi and divide by 4 pi. And the reason is that this quantity here with the 1 over 4 pi at the beginning is simply the effective aperture averaged over all 4 pi steridians, right? What we have is here is the effective aperture is a function of direction averaged by integration over a sphere and then divided by the number of steridians in a sphere. So this gives us the average effective area. So this whole thing here, the power generated by the antenna and delivered to the load, turns out to be equal to KTB times 4 pi divided by lambda squared times this average effective aperture. Now we go back to the thermodynamics. Since those two quantities, the power generated by the antenna and the power generated by the load, in this experiment must be equal. We set them equal, we divide out the common factors, and we find that 4 pi over lambda squared times the average effective aperture equals 1, so that the average effective aperture is simply lambda squared, wavelength squared, divided by 4 pi. This is a remarkably simple and useful conclusion, which is true for any antenna, and it gives us a direct relationship between this effective aperture, the thing that tells us how much power we can capture in terms of just wavelength. Now this is a little bit mind-blowing, so it's useful to think of some simple examples and what this means in those examples. And of course, the simplest antenna you can imagine is an isotropic antenna. Now I have to remind you, isotropic antennas do not exist in practice, but they're important as a concept as you're about to see. An isotropic antenna is one for which, of course, the effective aperture in any given direction is the same, and if the effective aperture in all directions is the same, then it's equal to the average effective aperture. So the effective aperture in any given direction is simply lambda squared divided by 4 pi, using the antenna theorem, and that's just 0 0.08 lambda squared, which is a pretty remarkable idea. The effective aperture of an isotropic antenna is about a tenth of a wavelength squared in any given direction. Now, any practical antenna, any realizable antenna, is going to have a maximum effective aperture which is greater than that of an isotropic antenna. So, for any practical antenna, the maximum effective aperture over 
all possible angles, has to be greater than that of an isotropic antenna, which is lambda squared over 4 pi. So now the question is, for a practical antenna, how much greater is this maximum effective aperture than that of the isotropic antenna? To understand that, let's use a simple example that we understand, that of the electrically short dipole once again. For an electrically short dipole, we just determined earlier, based on a completely different line of reasoning, that the maximum effective aperture of an electrically short dipole is 0.12 lambda squared times sine squared theta. And so the maximum value of that, with respect to theta and phi, is simply 0.12 lambda squared. So now if we look at the ratio of the maximum effective aperture of a electrically short dipole compared to that of the mythical isotropic antenna, we find the ratio of those two quantities is 1.5. Now that number 1.5 should be familiar to you. That in fact is the directivity of an electrically short dipole. In other words, what we have found is that the effective aperture of an electrically short dipole is equal to that of an isotropic antenna times the directivity of an electrically short dipole. And remember, directivity is a transmit concept. So here, for the electrically short dipole, we have found the connection between its transmit directivity and its effective aperture, which is a received concept. Now you could repeat this analysis for any other antenna, you would find the same relationship. In general, the effective aperture is equal to the directivity that you've computed in the transmit case times the quantity lambda squared divided by 4 pi. This remarkable finding allows us to do two very powerful things. First, we can now interpret the directivity, which we defined in the transmit case, and the associated pattern that we use to plot the directivity, also as the receive pattern. Now, when antenna folks talk about reciprocity or talk about the equivalence of transmit and receive patterns, this is what they're referring to. Secondly, we can interpret effective aperture also as a transmit parameter. That concludes this lecture on effective aperture.